Hey, hey, everyone. Um, hopefully we didn't leave anybody waiting. Um, I was just catching up with good old GB here. Um, for those of you who don't know, I will... Gabrielle, do you want to just do a quick intro? I think that's yeah. always helpful. Folks. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll introduce myself. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Gabrielle, or GB. Um, I was I was logging in here real quick. I didn't feel like typing out Gabrielle Blackwell. So I went in GB for this. I was so quick. Uh, but I'm a BDR manager at Airtable. I've been managing sales development and business development teams since 2017. So it's been a little while. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. I, I have too many dachshunds and I love plants and I love crystals. I'm a hippie dippy witch lady. And I really just think that we can do a lot better uh, in enabling people in the SDR leadership space to be really effective. So I, I launched... Cool. The new age leadership model and the first thing that came out was the SDR manager's survival guide. So yeah, we're here. Yes. And that is what got me like super jazzed to have you as like I, I don't know, have you as my guest here. Like I've done this Listen, twice. Like, yeah. I'm actually like a professional. Honestly, <laughs> you're like the you're like the Jimmy Fallon of SAS. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Fallon of Sass. I, I gotta learn how to sing if that's the case. Oh <laughs> that's good. Um, You're fine. Oh man, I love that. Um, he's, he's a cool dude. That'd be cool. Um, no, cool. But seriously, I, the roots on it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got. I got Will Balance in the background just mixing beats for me. <laughs> oh, we love it. We love it. We'll get Ding. Ding will be doing some raps in the background too. Dude, that'd be. I'd be into it. We get Ding on here. Um, that's that's gonna have to happen. Um, so, you wrote the SDR Manager's Survival Guide. I read it. I found it to be very insightful, mostly because yeah, you know, similar. I read an email guide like a year ago, just sort of in like some spare time, and like I remember one of the main motivations being, I don't think anybody's ever published like email etiquette and so it's just like it just seemed like an easy void to fill and I felt like with what you wrote it was like nobody's really written anything for managers in this sense right nobody's put it out there especially the way you did where it's like you know you're not even like you know upfront charging it's like hey if you want to throw me some you know bills to you know help pay the bills that'd be awesome but like you know use this take this it helped me it'll help you I love that like give first mantra I'm curious, like, it'd be really helpful for folks to hear from you, though. Like, how did you, uh, what what inspired you? What got you going on this? Yeah, great question. And I I do agree. Like, I think I've, um, I've been trying to figure out, like, just how to be really good at what I do. And it's taken a while. And it's only been, as I mentioned, I've been managing a team since 2017, minus, like, a one-year break. And it's only been in the past like year and a half that I've really felt like, oh, like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I was like, I, I, right? I'm like, wow, like why yeah. did it take like it's a three year ramp? That's ridiculous. And so I, I, and then I also um, kind of had, and it's not for lack of of trying or studying. Like I think there's a lot of content, really great content out there for how do you set up a BDR program from an operational and from like a technical standpoint and like, what do you need to like get headcount? But in terms of how do you lead, how do you coach, how do you develop? Like, how do you do this in a data informed, AKA you're not a bunch of just like data jockeys and telling people just to do more. Like no one yeah. does, no, like that's I'm like, I haven't really seen anybody talk about how to do this aside from like a Kevin Dorsey. And so I found myself in a position not too long ago where I was also working for this like tyrant and my ass was on the line as a manager. I'm like, this is so embarrassing that the first time I'll be on a pip is like as a manager. Um, yeah. and I, like, <laughs> You're like, I crushed this route. What happened? I was like, I, I was like, I used, no, I'm like, I used to be really good at my job. Um, and it, and it wasn't like it was my first time managing. This is like my second or third time managing a team. 
And I think I just realized, I'm like, all right, whatever got me to this point is no longer going to help me get to the next level of my career. And I'm also yeah. working for somebody who will fire me in a heartbeat. So I was in survival mode. So like that's where SDR manager survival guide came from. But it yeah. also was like, I really need to learn all the intricacies because I'm legit like my ass is gonna be I swear a lot I'm like my I'm gonna be on like my job's gonna be on the line so I need to figure this out I need to figure out quickly and so I just started documenting all the things that I was learning everything that I felt like was helpful everything that was building I also started sharing that out in like mentorship sessions that I was having when people were asking questions and then yeah. it's been more recently where I've just had these notes with me for about a year or so now um and I was talking to someone and I was like wait a minute this is like this 17th time that I've given this content out to people, I could probably <laughs> yeah. just put it out there and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this to me is, again, like, this is what's needed at the very least to survive as, a, as an effective SDR leader. Yeah. So that's what from. You, you mentioned uh, mentorship sessions. So you're doing like one-on-ones with other managers to help them up their game? Yeah. So yeah, there's some people that I talk to and like, or people who are, yeah, they're new to management that I work with, or they've been in management for a while. And I, I'm just like, I, I want, at the end of the day, like Esther leaders, BDR managers, whatever, we are in such a awesome, but also yeah. like informative uh, or formative part of someone's career journey. So I'm like, if we mess it up, like we're really messing with people's careers for real, for yeah. real. Yeah. Like, yeah. if, people, if someone has a terrible experience as a BDR, like, do they want to keep on working in sales? Do they keep on want to work in tech, right? So, and then also, if people have terrible experiences and then they become leaders, they might only know a terrible model and they continue to perpetuate non-sensory. So, yeah. like, I, if there are ways to be better for the people that we're leading, like, I, I want to be a part of that. Like, I, I don't want to just point at people and say, oh, that manager sucks. I'm like, I just think that we haven't really been given a model of how to be amazing and how to be great. So that's like, that's also been prompting this, like, I want to share content that's going to help people. Yeah. And I think there's just like so much value to that, like peer to peer aspect, right? When I do my email coaching sessions, sometimes I'm actually just clarifying my thoughts in those sessions. Cause I'm like, I'm seeing experiences that other people are having and I'm like, you know, I, I think that's good. But now that I'm seeing it there, I don't yeah. know if it's always good. And now I'm like thinking about it more situationally. So I think there's like a ton of value to that. So I think it's cool that you're doing yeah. that. Yeah. There's this whole like metacognition, which is just you, you start to like think about how you think. You're like, oh, like, why do I think that way? And mentors, like you mentoring other people is like the most effective way to actually do that practice. So and people yes. are like, oh, like, will you please, you know, will you be a mentor of mine? Like, we can meet. Like, I had someone recently, someone I'm going to start mentoring, um, like, now. Uh, but she's like, hey, maybe we can meet up, like, once every six months. I'm like, no, girl, I need to talk to you sooner than that. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to help you. <laughs> well, I was like, listen, like, I, listen, I, I want to, I'm going to say some stuff to you. But if I say it out loud, I might go, that doesn't make any sense what you just said. <laughs> Oh, well, also, I think like, I, need key all, I need y'all so that I can get better, please. Six months? <laughs> what? Six months. Also, it's like I give you advice and then like turns out to be the wrong advice. How are we going to course correct? Like, yeah. that's, that's like the yeah. big thing when I do email coaching and I give someone a piece of advice and they just like disappear into the ether. I'm like, please reach back out because yeah. like, you got to course correct if it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh there was someone they're not it wasn't an SDR leader, it was somebody who's in an SDR seat. They're like, Hey, mm -hmm. I'm having this challenge with my manager. And I'm like, I'm gonna give them some advice and it's either gonna work or they might get fired. And I I, I just I just need you to let me know what happens. So if yeah. it worked really well, awesome. But if it didn't, I should probably stop giving that advice. So I need I need the closure. <laughs> I followed I followed up. I was like, Hey, I haven't heard from you. I'm assuming things went well. He's like, Yeah, they're great. I'm like, wonderful. Okay, we're good. Oh, man. Uh, okay, you mentioned career pathing, though. I think that's a really interesting topic. So when I think about who might be listening in and who might get value from this, there's probably some you know, BDRs, individual contributors in the audience who are thinking to themselves, do I want to go that traditional AE route? Do mm -hmm. I want to go, you know, maybe a non-traditional route like CSM or like mm -hmm. into marketing? 
like I was talking with Kyle Coleman the other day and he's like, I've had people go into like technical solutions managers, right? But yeah, what's the, what do you think are the key definers that tell you, yeah, someone is better fit for management versus individual contributorship? Ooh, okay. I know you prepped me with this question. And I think like at the time I was like, I got it. I know the answers in your answer. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, I don't even know. Honestly, I think like, okay, so I'll just share it for me. I never felt the draw towards becoming an AE. Like I was a really great BDR and SDR, like mm-hmm. broke every record, was hitting like 200% of my number, um, was like 3Xing what the next person was doing. And I, more than anything else, like what, I remember the manager that I had at the time, he's like, yo, it's really great what you're doing on your own. What's going to open up more doors for you is, or he's like, what's going to, yeah, what's really going to open up the most doors for you is when you figure out how to operationalize your own success. And so I started to like, just, yeah, like figure out like, why is what I'm doing working? Like, yeah. and, 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 uh, and also how can I iterate over time? And then I got really curious about like, hey, like what helps other people be successful? And like my way is not the only way. So I became mm-hmm. very, very, very curious about just like what does it take to be successful? I got really, really curious about what gets in the way from a process perspective, from a people perspective, from a mindset perspective as well. And then I think I started to actually fall more in love with the idea and the process of helping other people realize their own goals than me realizing my own goals by myself. So like, that, I think, I think if like, uh, I don't know yeah. that any one person is like better suited, but I think from a, like a level of fulfillment and experience of meaning and purpose, like for me, I was like, I can't wait to impact somebody's life in a very powerful way. And I get that opportunity every single day in my job. Like, if that doesn't sound exciting, like, I don't think you should go into leadership. Yeah. Oh, man, that's really cool. Uh, I think one of the things that I was hearing as you were describing that is, you know, this understanding of your goals. As a manager, how do you pull that out of people to help them realize it or you know, help them realize that there's a different path they want to go down? Yeah. I ask questions really because like what I was talking about was like meaning, fulfillment, purpose, those kinds of things. And so I ask people about like, hey, you know, when when you think of purpose or fulfillment, like what pops up for you? And when have you felt that? Like, like well, I'll even do like visualization exercises, right? So, yeah. hey, like think about a time where you felt super fulfilled, like everything was meaningful, super joyous, whatever. Like, where were you? Who were you with? What were you doing? Those kinds of things. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think there are some times where people were like, hey, honestly, like, I was with a team, right? Like, I was being supported by other people. I was, you know, like, I got to contribute towards something bigger than myself, right? Those kinds of things. Um, If people are saying those kinds of things, I'm like, hey, like, have you thought about leadership? Mm -hmm. and management. And I also think about times where people, like I'll just observe people. And if they're ones who are actively like curious about how other people are doing things, and they're also being very mindful of like, how is the team feeling? Um, How are people doing? Like, what does the team need from a tools basis, from like a management or, or like, hey, like managers, how can you show up better for the team? I think if people are looking at that critically and also giving feedback to me and that might be scary of like, yo, like you've kind of got a boldness about you that I think is necessary to be in a leadership or a management position. Um, And again, I I just think about the people that I meet and they're just like, they, I think they also in a lot of ways are kind of the change agents in the sense of they know shitty leadership when they see it and they're not willing to put up with it. And they're very opinionated about how things should be better. And they're like, oh, I need to be in a position where I can actually influence that. So um, I think those are, are really, and again, I think there has to be curiosity about all the different ways. There doesn't have to be, like you can be a person in a management position and just say like, do this or else. Um, but I think the right. best leaders that I've seen are the ones who are like, 
how can I be relevant to as many people as possible? Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty powerful stuff right there. That's uh, why you asked me to be here. Pow, 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 pow. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm thinking of the, the opposite, right? I think about the structure of an organization. There can only be so many managers. And mm -hmm. yeah, I imagine some people really aspire to that idea of moving into leadership, but maybe they're not the right fit for that. As a manager, mm -hmm. how do you broach that conversation? I, I think there are like some glaring signs that people are not like, maybe like leadership is not for them. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's hard, like, but it's weird because you have a lot of people who are in management who, who shouldn't be <laughs> like, so I'm just kind of like, yeah. I don't know that there's any, I don't, like, I, like, again, I've, I've, I've worked for some psychopaths. <laughs> like, yeah. like, yeah. How are you in a leadership position? But they, they just present very well to the appropriate people. Um, they suck to work for, but, you know, I, I think if, I think, honestly, I think a lot of it is probably coachable. Like I think anybody can be a leader regardless of your title. Um, yeah. I mean, if someone's a, like a total narcissist, like clinical. Yeah. I, I think it's tough, but there's a lot of people in that, like a lot of people in leadership positions who are like that. So I'm like, it's, it's hard yeah. for me to go, like, how it's, can I tell someone you're not a leader? Like, unless they're just a total lone wolf and everybody on the team hates them and yeah. uh, they don't follow any of the rules and they don't take direction. They're not coachable. And they're like, well, I want, I want to be a leader. And I'm like, what is a leader? Yeah, that, that like, coachability, it, it almost like reflects both ways, right? If yeah. you're coachable, you'd be better at coaching because you're more receptive to it. Something, yeah. I mean, it's some like I mean, again, I think there there I think there needs to be a team yeah. orientation. It, uh, so it reminds if me if you don't have that, I'm like, how are you going to lead a team if you're not team oriented? Yeah, I, I will say though, like for those those managers out there, the ones that we know that don't really belong, right? That part of me is like, brings me back to a quote my mom used to tell me. It's like, yeah, the kids aren't the problem, it's the parents. <laughs> and so you have to go back to the manager who managed them. <laughs> and that's where they got all those crazy habits from. It's a yeah, bit like, mm -hmm. there's that. Yeah. I, think, I think a lot of this stuff is coachable. I think just, there has to be a willingness to get better. And so yeah, maybe it, maybe it's the coachability. Because again, I think yeah. people who are, I mean, there's a behavioral aspect of like, you can teach somebody all the right skills from um, a leadership standpoint, from a management standpoint, people management, talent, all those. But if they aren't willing or, uh, or if they're unable to actually lead people in a way where people will trust them and follow them, like, I think that has more so to do with like, there's like some something else in the background right, that's going on that's like actually yeah. legit that's there I, I do think that the majority of people if they wanted to be a really effective leader like they could i think everybody has a potential yeah well and to that point right let's let's sort of like shift the gear towards yeah identifying gaps in management quality and like okay learning how to reassess and like change course because i think that kind of speaks to a bit of your journey and that you were talking about being in survival mode my team's not hitting their numbers what am i going to do yep. um and like we don't have to go like direct comparison but i'm curious like let's start with just like those first few months in management mm -hmm. like what do you think a lot of managers struggle with most coming out of the gate is it just like learning the 101 of what is this role now there's so many pieces I will say, I, I mean, I kind of joked around at the beginning of like, oh, a three-year ramp. I just think, one, it's hard to go from being an individual contributor to then becoming a people manager or people leader. Um, it's a different mindset. So I think the biggest shift is like, it's no longer about you being the best. It's about you enabling everyone on your team to be their best. And their best is going to look very different from what your best did. So like, for example, I was having a conversation with somebody that I'd worked for and they were like, hey, how I got my team to be successful was this way. Like they're an operator, like a drill sergeant, and I don't lead that way. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're like, you should do this. And I'm like, if you no, 
Like I will leave you in a second because I'm like, that's not me in my absolute best. So like their job is more so to figure out like, what are my strengths, right? In the same way for my team, like I got to go like for all the individuals on my team, I need to really like establish that relationship with them. I need to really get to know them. I need to be very curious about them. And it's not about like, hey, just make these calls. It's like, hey, I need to understand like, what are you motivated by? What are your strengths? What are your areas of improvement? And I think if you can start off there, like you don't need to be an, you don't need to be like the expert of the numbers. You just need to be great at making sure your team will run through a brick wall for you. Yeah. Okay? So that to me, the crux of it is like the relationship that you have with them. Best way to not build a relationship is for you to, whether purposely or not purposely, make it seem like you're better at them than their job. That's not your role anymore. Your role is not to be the best yeah. SDR. Your role is to make sure your reps are better than you were, but to figure out what's the path in their own authentic way to get them to be that yeah. way. And it's interesting. I, I see a lot of managers who like, they still think in this one way of like, you know, this is how I did it. And it worked that way. Like you should mm -hmm. do it that way. And like, particularly when we start talking about email, like email has changed since a lot of managers were actually in the individual contributor seat. And so you have a lot of like really awkward, like, no, I mean, like there's a reason the reply rate is what it is, right? <laughs> They're doing the right things. Um, yeah. That's a, that's like one of those interesting things. Of it's like, yeah, you kind of have to get outside of what you know and like mm -hmm. you only know. Um, yeah. I think there's one more thing of also like, providing feedback and like the the big meaty project that would be next up for like the content drop is really going to be on feed like delivering feedback um i think at least what i struggled with was basically prioritizing my own comfort over challenging the people on my team in the way they need to be challenged and how that would look was i needed to deliver like critical feedback that yeah. maybe they didn't want to hear or I was worried like, oh, if I deliver this and they're not going to like me. And then what ends up happening is like, they're not getting better. I'm like coddling yeah. them. So uh, also part of the reason why I share out the content that I share out is uh, me really understanding like how to look at performance in production from a BDR standpoint, how to interpret the information and the data, and then how to then like diagnose the issues and then deliver that feedback to the team and know which numbers I'm, I'm like measuring and trying to impact. It gave me a lot more confidence that the feedback that I was giving was actually going to make a difference. And if I was de delivering sometimes like harsh feedback, it's like, it was very logical. Like it wasn't just me being a jerk. It's like, no, if you don't do this, you're going to hit 60% of your number. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not, <laughs> not liking you it's like you're, you're not gonna hit your number if you don't do you're this. just not gonna hit, you're not gonna hit your number you're not gonna make the money that you want to make you're likely gonna like i was like if this continues like you're not gonna be able to continue to work here like is that what you want like yeah. are you okay with that and if it's like no i'm not okay with that i'm like okay cool are you open to making a change i've got some suggestions yeah and it, it, the tough part right is getting into that yeah you know, awkward conversation of like yeah you know, this yeah. isn't happening the way it's supposed to and you need to make yeah. it happen the way it's supposed to otherwise the things that you care about don't happen right yeah um nobody wants to have that conversation uh um, yeah that's where the having that initial like what should like what uh, recommendation not saying that the majority yeah. of leaders aren't doing this but i think what was really, really important, not just for first time managers, but even for people who are stepping in and inheriting team, uh, inheriting, inheriting a team or like getting new reps or whatever is like really taking the time to build trust and credibility. And I think the best way to do this is people feel heard, understood, acknowledged and cared for. Like pretty much every engagement survey you're ever going to take. The first question is, uh, do you feel like your manager cares about you? Yeah. And like, if the manager is just like berating you and telling you you're doing these things wrong, that, I don't think that's going to be the case, right? No. It's, the, it's that extra work that you're talking about of like understanding what's going to motivate them. Yeah. Yeah. There's like the carrot and the stick. And if you're only showing the stick, like. I don't believe in sticks. Get rid of the sticks. No more sticks. <laughs> no more sticks. 
Yeah. No. Well, and I love the way you like <laughs> leave out the feedback too. It wasn't like, you know, I'm going to fire you. It's literally just like, hey, yeah, these are the prerequisites to having a job here. But it's yep. also like, here's, before you even said that, I was like, here are the things that you want. Is it, do you have it like framed out in your mind? Like when I'm writing a cold email or an email in general, I love to like frame out where each piece of info is going. So is it like, mm -hmm. like what, what are the things in that conversation that happen along the way? Yeah. Um, in like a feedback conversation or in like yeah. a getting to know each other conversation. I, Probably. yeah, the feedback, like I, um, this is how I do it. I will, I really like nonviolent forms of communication, like a framework. So you, you make an observation, uh, you share your feeling about it. You make a request, right? Mm. Uh, observe, uh, concern, uh, observe, feeling, need. Oh, you state what your need is and then you make a request, right? So in a, in a business setting, I don't use feelings anymore because um, I'm a woman and sometimes people will call me emotional and I don't like that. So I say concerns instead. Uh, so I'm like, hey, like here's my observation. And an observation is not judgmental. It's purely facts. Like, hey, one, you know, I'm, I'm observing that you're pacing towards 60% of your number. And we have three weeks left to go in the quarter. It's an observation, right? Like my biggest concern is that if nothing else changes, I'll need to I'll need to manage your performance on a more formal basis, right? Yeah. Right. So my my like what I'm really so the request or the question that I'm asking is like, hey, like help me understand, like how are you feeling about your performance? Mm -hmm. Right. I like I'll tell you, like I'm underwater and I, I don't think I'm gonna hit my quota. Yeah, I'm just like, hey, like, how like how do you feel about it? And then if someone's like, oh, hey, I feel great about it. And you're <laughs> like, well, here's the problem. Like, okay, yeah, <laughs> so like, cool, like, we got to figure out what frame of reference that we're on. Yeah. But I again, I always like to just call it out, like, hey, like, here's what I'm seeing. If I have a concern, I just share what those concerns are. I might, uh, again, depending on how many conversations that we've had thus far, like this is the first time that we're having a conversation and normally we're going to know much sooner. Like yeah. I'll know much sooner in the quarter, like how you're going to hit, but I'll just go like, Hey, like, Hey, you told me that the goal that you had performance wise was to get hundred percent. I'm seeing there's a pretty big gap in that right now. You know, we talked about certain activities that needed to happen in order to get there. It's been two weeks now where you're not doing those activities. Help me understand what's getting in the way. Yeah. Well, and that as a manager, right? You're trying to get the best performance out of your team. It's like, is there an obstacle? Is there just something? You yeah. I, yeah. I do also like saying like, instead of saying like, oh, why aren't you doing this? Because also for SDRs and BDRs, like these are people who are for the most part, don't have a lot of experience. So if I treat mm -hmm. them like they're an experienced hire, that's a mismatch in leadership to yeah. reality. So recognizing that these are folks who are learning sales and sales development for the first time. They're learning about how to operate in a corporate setting at the same time. For some people, they're in a remote setting for some, you know, this might be their first job ever. So um, if I say like, why aren't you doing this? You know, they might be like, it might put them in a defensive mode. So I always like to ask like, Hey, like what's getting in the way? I don't want to make it an about you thing. I might not know exactly what are all the processes that they have to go through. I'm constantly surprised at how nonsensical the processes are in sales dev. Um, and, but then it's like, if over time, like, Hey, like I've committed to, we've both made agreements and commitments that we're going to follow this plan. And you're still not doing these things that we agreed to. Then I'll have to go, Hey, this is the third week in the row that we're having this conversation. I don't actually think this is a development issue. I think this might be like a, uh, a performance or a behavioral issue though. And here's how I can see that. Yeah. But before I even go there, what do you think? Most of the time those conversations lead to, Hey GB, honestly, I'm just not really digging it. And I'm like, or they go, Oh, Hey GB, I'm trying my best. I just don't know if I can keep going. And then we have to go like, let's go back to your motivations. Let's revisit that. Like, no, yeah. let's do some encouragement. Like I, I do have those, but sometimes for some people, they're like, I'm just not motivated to do the job. I can't coach to that. Yeah. Dang. You're like a borderline therapist. It's sweet. Oh, I'm hundred <laughs> percent a therapist. Listen, all, yeah. all those therapy sessions, all my self-development help books, all that, yeah. you know? Oh, I was yeah. Like, 
I'm like, hey, listen, mom, all that generational trauma that I had to heal and all the cycles I had to break, it's helping me at work too. Yeah. Now I can do it for other people. (laughs) Well, and on that note of helping other people, I'm curious as you think about the managers out there that are kind of struggling, like, and this, this could be advice for the reps who work under their managers. Maybe they're identifying that, you know, their manager isn't necessarily as awesome as you are. And they're like, what do I need to do in order to get, Mm -hmm. you know, more from my manager Mm -hmm. Um, or vice versa? You're a leader watching this Mm -hmm. and you're thinking to yourself, how do I better support the managers that work for me? What are things that we could be doing to better support the frontline managers out there? Yeah, I think something that's really helpful is first and foremost, like setting really clear expectations around what, yeah, exactly. Like what is, what is expected from a manager? What is, what does good look like and how do we get there? I like, there was one document that I had in the survival guide was the um, just like responsibilities of an SDR leader. I, that was inspired by, again, I was working for the time for a tyrant. And even though my team was hitting their numbers, even though like people were doing a really great job. um, And even though I was like, mentoring and training up other managers like my peers uh this person was basically trying to make it seem like i wasn't doing my job and now so you're, the, you're like hold up so that, yes abilities yes. yeah to be and they couldn't and then i went to i did a skip level i went to the senior director and the senior director was like well do you feel like you have clear expectations of what your job is and i was like no i don't outside of performance outside of engagement I was like, I'm not really sure what else I should be doing. And so then I wrote down everything. I was like, all right, well, let me just write it all down. And then I'll go to the senior director and I'll go, is this what I need to be doing? Like, here's everything that I'm doing right now that's leading to performance um, and engagement. Like, am I missing something right now? And so that was really to help manage manage up. So I think one question or so I think first and foremost, it's things that are very helpful is when expectations are really, really clear. Now, that being said, the frequency at which expectations are very clear is not that much. <laughs> I was gonna say I I know that. What? <laughs> I tell you um, one thing, and then like I've changed my mind, but I haven't communicated with you in like a couple. Yeah. Of days. So yeah. <laughs> this is more so like I mean, if if you have things where expectations are really clear and like why this is important is I think people do better. I mean, we're we're working in this world of. Um, like both you and I, like we work in SaaS and it's companies that are like figuring out, trying to grow, doing all these things. And with that, there are going to be a lot of ambiguity. And so if we can at least align out some structure, just in terms of expectations, we might not know exactly how to hit those. At least then we have some kind of like parameters. Like they, like this is our sandbox that we play in. And this is how we know that we're like in a good space, however, wherever that is. Um, So So that's like the first part. Now, if you are a rep and you feel like your manager is not doing that great, uh, the importance of feedback, right, is feedback needs to be specific and it needs to be actionable. Yeah, actually, we we just got a comment from Ben. uh, I'm going to totally mispronounce this. It's either Busick or Busick, um, which was my least favorite one-on-one question was, how can I help you today? Which is like not specific, very big, mm. right? Yeah. Sort of exactly that bill. Yeah. I, okay. So I hear you. I also like, I like to ask, hey, like, how can I, how can I better support you? That's usually the last question that I ask though. Like we have an agenda. I have a proposed mm-hmm. agenda with my team. That's part one. Secondly though, is if the BDR has, or SDR, the rep has something they they're like listen this is top of mind i will move the agenda off to the side i'm like this is really their time now at the end of the conversation though like if we've like what we should be doing as well is like hopefully we are in a one-on-one setting like hey how are you uh like what's like what's working well what's getting in the way what are your like what are your goals that you need to um that you need in order to attain like your whatever you need to focus on to attain what your goals are um if we've gone through that, we've mapped out a plan, we've done all those things, we have our action items. The last question I'll ask, it's in, it's again, it's in the spirit of how can I help you, but it's just more so like, where do you feel like I can be better for you? 
Yeah. Like that's the essence of the question. And so granted, not everybody's going to know the answer to that, but at least I want to ask them that question so they can think about it. But it's like, my role is to be in service to the people on my team, like, yeah. and be in service to the business too. But it's like, all right, how, essentially, how do you need me to show up for you, for you to feel better, feel more confident, feel more competent? Of course, I have my boundaries, like, I'm not about to break my back in an unreasonable yeah. way, right? Like, <laughs> like you know, but um, if it's something that's like, hey, like it's it's deserved, it's it's reasonable, like it's a fair ass is the very least I can do is show up in a way where you feel good and it helps you perform and it helps you feel engaged. Like I'll do that. Do you, do you have any examples of like questions that you've got in response to that or maybe comments that you've gotten in response to that? Yeah, I so if I'm like, hey... Um, how can I be a better support to you? Um, a lot of times people are like, let me think about it. Sometimes people are like, hey, I just have this idea and I'd love to run you through it, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of times with reps, what I've seen is, especially when people are early on in the SD or BDR role is like, they might not have built up a lot of confidence in their ideas, or they might be a little bit hesitant about yeah. pushing forward things that they want to see happen. And so, um, so a lot of times like validation is needed. So they're like, Hey, like what I'm really needing is to get your perspective on the sequence that I built. And what they're really saying is like, Hey, I want to launch this, but I don't know if it's good or not. And I go do it. That's exactly what they're saying. Yeah. Literally just do it. <laughs> like, Hey, yeah. like let's just, it's, or it's like, Oh, Hey, like consider this one thing. Right. Awesome. Um, sometimes people will need help dealing with certain sources of conflict, whether it's conflict with their peers, conflict mm -hmm. with uh, maybe AE that they're paired with. Um, uh, sometimes they're like, hey, I feel like this isn't fair to me. And then I have to quickly manage their expectations that the business is not built around fairness. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. So that's the other things. I mean, sometimes people are like, hey, listen, like the team is feeling like crap. Like, we might have just gotten our teeth kicked in in a month or like somebody might have had 12 meetings reschedule. So like, they're like, Hey, I just, I just need to like vent. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Right on. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, that's cool. um, so big part of the role is like hiring slash onboarding. Mm -hmm. When you're going to hire reps. Yeah. There's the classic, like, you're looking to figure out if they have curiosity or something like what are the like actual, you know, tactical brass text things that you're trying to suss out from mm. a glance at a resume, but also from those initial conversations. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm honestly, this is probably one area that I have the most room to develop in. So I'm like, again, if I can hire the best more often, like that's me doing my job way better. Right. So um, what I'm, learning right now because it's very top of mind for me is like there are the like intangibles like okay like they're driven they you know like they've got a track like, like hey like they're they're driven to perform highly and so I might look at do they have a record of high attainment or high achievement whether like maybe they went to a really selective school like they were on a sports team of some sort uh and did really well like they could have been in competitions or whatever, like whatever, like what, or whatever arena of performance that they were in, like they did it better than anybody else. So I yeah. want to like look for those kinds of things. Um, I think secondly is uh, I look for, so it's like, it's drive, right? So the three parts of it, it's like, there's a need to achieve. So it's a high attainment. There's the, uh, they take thrill in competition, not in a sense of like, it's not cutthroat, but like, yeah. they're like, oh, so and so is better than me. I want to go. I want to go play. I want to go play with them because if I play with people yeah. who are better than me, then I'll get better along the way. Um, but then I think there gets to a point where uh, it's more so a competition against themselves. Like they're just trying to one up themselves every single time. And I think there's also like the third piece of this is they're optimistic, and I think it's optimistic in their own abilities, like not this unrealistic optimism that everything is going to turn out okay, but it's like they have a deep seated belief in their abilities to get things done. And so therefore yeah. they like do the work to get there. So there are questions that I can ask that will 
get um, I got this from Kevin Dorsey, but he's like, hey, if there's something that you really want to understand about somebody's motivations or their characteristics, you want to ask them to give you at least three examples. So it's like, hey, I see that, you know, you were top performer on your team, like walk with your how you got there. How else has that shown up in your life? Like, was it just a one time thing? Great, you yeah. were a top performer at one job in this one arena. Like, yeah, is it like myopic to that experience? Yeah, or is it like, or is this a true characteristic? Other things that I also will look for are, and I'm, I don't know how to do this just yet. And we're actually going to do an, uh, I'm going to do like a workshop with our recruiting team here to reverse engineer, like, hey, like here are our competencies, and then how do we back that into questions that we can ask to see if people have like the aptitude to level up in those competencies. Because I see people, a lot of, like I, I have hired people for like just pure like intangibles and they come into the role and there's just way too many things to learn all at once. And then they become overwhelmed or it's like, this is not the right sales motion for them to start off with whatever. And then it doesn't work out very well. Right. Yeah. So uh, certain things that I also want to, I'm trying to think, I, I haven't figured out the aptitude piece. I think it has more so to do with like their ability to adapt and adjust in certain situations. Yeah, like, like that to me is probably like the things. When you sort of go down this path, are you saying more like, um, like they've got like some tech savviness to them, right? Like they understand. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think there's probably some questions. That I, I haven't, I actually haven't like oh. assessed for that tech savviness yet. Yeah, um, and I don't have like a good phrase for it, but. Yeah, I, I was even just thinking about like, Hey, like it's almost like, hey, like uh, adaptability, meaning we completely change and shift the model because it's going to happen. <laughs> like yeah. we might, we're going to, yeah. Like, hey, like we completely shift the model. I said, I want to understand how long does it take for them to make that mental shift? Now, if someone can make a mental shift in a week, great. If someone needs six months to deprogram and then reprogram, I'm like, we're that's not going to work out. So yeah. I might also want to understand, like, hey, tell it's a little bit annoying, but it's like, hey, like, tell me about a time where like priorities completely shifted. And I won't just say, like, give me the situation. What did you do? I'll also ask them about like, hey, what was the experience like? Like, um, uh, uh, where did you get stuck? How did you get unstuck? Who did you get help from? And if they can't answer those questions, like they essentially just sit back by themselves alone and suffer. I'm like, I don't know how well they can adapt or adjust. Interesting. Yeah. Hiring's hard. Hiring's like, so hard. <laughs> the the worst part is like, I'm just an optimist. And so I like, I meet these people and I'm just like, oh, you're going to rock it. And then I'm like, wait, I can't hire all, everybody that I just talked to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I've, I've had to learn over time to be a bleeding yeah. heart. Like who I was at 20, uh, 26 and my first time managing. And like, I turned 32 in a couple of months. I like my 26 year old self feel like you, you cold hearted wench. What is, you know, like, how could you, how could you, everything's amazing. Like, I was like, Hey, like, should we list out all the people like are all the miss miss hiring decisions that we've made because we went in there with rose colored glasses. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's so true. I mean, one of the one of the great things is we brought on Amy Volus as an advisor, and she was like adamant about us setting up like scorecards. Yes. Uh, which like that has been like super helpful. It's just like, okay, what are the things that they're gonna do? And then like backfilling all the way to the questions that you're gonna ask in your interview, standardizing to a point. Yes. The competence like reverse engine. Yeah. So like that's why I'm really excited. I actually bought a book. The book is on its way. What's uh, the book? I, think called, I think it's called For Your Improvement, okay. uh, like competency mapping, something along those lines. So um, our recruiting uh, our recruiting partner for BizDev at Airtable, um, her name's Megan. Uh, but she, yeah, she's like, hey, like this is the book that we're going to use to guide us through this workshop of taking your competencies and mapping that back to questions and then having a scoring system around that. So it also removes a lot of bias too. Like, yeah. I, I, I can hire I can hire people who again like they they basically just like you know because also sometimes you could like fall in love with these people. Hundred <laughs> percent because you're like this is just a good human. Yeah, like, like I was like, oh man, they made me feel amazing. I'd love uh, to work with them. All this other stuff, and then 
you this take one a moment, you like take the weekend and you come back and you're like, wait a minute, there were a lot of red flags. <laughs> oh, my favorite was we interviewed this one guy. He's he was great. He like it's just literally right guy, wrong time. Uh, but after the interview, you know, we yeah, walk different ways. Um <laughs> sent me a hat in the mail that said I interviewed his name uh, and all I got out of it was this lousy hat and it was like purple and I was like dang this guy at some point we're gonna hire this human being like stellar stellar person but it was just like man I was like I got that and like my heart was just like oh how can I not do this <laughs> yeah, there's also I think one of also the, the the challenge that I'm seeing now for it's uh challenge might not be the, the best word for it, but the observation that I have now is there are a lot of like boot camps and resources out there that are really teaching people how to interview well for the SDR or BDR role, but they're not actually teaching them how to do the SDR or BDR role very well. So I think there's uh, there's a big mismatch in terms of people are like, hey, I'm super excited about the chase of you hiring like they're like more in love with getting hired than they are of actually doing the job yeah the I and they the come in they're like wait a minute i'm gonna have to do this all the time and you're like yeah, yeah that's the job <laughs> yeah and what's interesting about that too is one of the like obvious corollaries for founders would be accelerated programs a lot of them are glorified you know funding boot camps to go like, here's how you go pitch to investors, not actually like go fix your business. Yeah. <laughs> um, which yep. I think we've seen like that trend come and go and like the true ones that exist out there that are quality still exist. But mm -hmm. I think we'll see some similar trends. In that yeah, world. it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. So I know I, I am I I think there are some diamonds in the rough who come out of those programs. But it's mm -hmm. again like these are I'm trying to think about it. Like, uh, there's one woman, uh, Andrea Oliveros from, she's a CSM at Gong. So she was on my team and she came through uh, Flock J. And I'm trying to think about things that really stood out to me about her was like, she, uh, I remember she like ran a really solid discovery and I was doing this, just, uh, this role play call with, the, one of my peers and he was like super curmudgeon -y. and he was kind of like being a jerk and so she just like laughed it off and I was like she's gonna do so well because she like just doesn't take it too seriously um but Ember like she she was like she was awesome like she just worked really really hard the more yeah. I found out about her the more I was like oh like at every single stage of her life she chose to work hard because she's like if I just work hard I know I'll improve my life and I'm trying to improve my life and so yeah. and like in that way, she was so intrinsic, like she just so, like there was something like very deep seated within her that it just didn't really matter what else, like she was going to figure out a way to make it happen. And I think that there's like that kind of core quality that we, like, I'm, I'm glad we're, look at us metacognating right now, Will. Um, <laughs> it is. That's actually why we go live. People can watch yeah, us. Yeah, is like I, I, I think I for a moment like I knew I've known that for a very long time, but I think I just I just remembered like how important it is because I even think about that for myself where I was just in this place where I'm like, listen, I know my life is going to get way better. Period, because I'm going to do the work for it, and there's nothing that anybody can do to stop me. I got this line from Scott Lee, but he's basically like, somebody's going to give me the opportunity to do that, and they're going to make they're going to be so happy that they did. Like, are you that person? Yeah, that's just what it is. Yeah. So I think there's like a, there's like a there's like a gumption in a fire that's there. Like, listen, if the worst thing in the world that happens is someone tell a stranger that I don't know tells me no, yeah, and you're uh, still gonna pay me, I'll be fine. <laughs> I'll they, be fine. Um, so yeah, I think there also is like there's a little bit of that like chip on the shoulder. I call it an fu mentality. Yep. People judge me. Like, Why would you want to have somebody who has an effing mentality? I'm like, because they do the best. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the venture capitalist. He's over at Lux Capital. And he's got this phrase that he, he says all the time, which is chips on shoulders, chips in pockets. Which yeah, like, I like that. He, he's like always down to bet on somebody with a big old chip on their shoulder. Yeah. Um, Ooh, whoever yeah. posted that last comment, I think the biggest mistakes people seeking BDR roles make is entering the hunt, wanting to prove themselves rather than preparing to do a good job. I 
there I've met some people that are just like, listen, I just want to prove that I'm like a really good cold caller. <laughs> That's a interesting, interesting path. Um, it's a, well, it's just, it's a little bit of like, oh, I don't know. I think there's, I think there's it's a, not actually passionate for what we do, right? No, like one of it's the things not. I'm curious about is like, why do you want to come work here? Like, what about what mm -hmm. we do is interesting to you? And yeah. then like later in the conversation, like trying to get them to talk about something that they're passionate about and seeing if A and B match. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, what's like, yeah, I think there's got to be like a, I think there has to be like a humility there too of like, I mean, to this point of like doing a good job, like this is something like my grandfather raised me and he's like, Gabrielle, no matter what, just go in and do a really, like, he's like do good work. So mm -hmm. I think there also has to be like a commitment to doing what it takes to do good work. And so I, I think this is probably why like athletes are, or people with from athletic backgrounds are, are um, seen as like a, a gold standard. Not yeah. saying that everybody needs to be an athlete, but it's more so looking at the characteristics that you might develop through playing sports, which is um, a certain degree of like, you know, when you go into practice, like how you're supposed to behave, like, you know what you need to do. You know, if you don't do it, you're going to be running until you vomit. Yeah. <laughs> like, so like there's a certain level of like yeah, keep doing it <laughs> right like and you have to keep so there's, there's a there's a discipline there's a commitment like you know like you understand that the importance of practice and that goes into your game as well and i don't think that only happens in sports right i think that can happen yeah. in, in whether it's in, in school or if you've been an entrepreneur like you sell in bubble gum, right? In like first grade or whatever. But like you you can recognize like how your behaviors lead to achievement. Yeah. You can connect the dots. And so therefore you know that all the little pieces will build up time over time. So I think that's like one of those key traits, right? Is are they not just like, yeah, interviewing to get the job, but like can they prove they have like that discipline to keep it going afterwards? Mm -hmm. Um I want to make sure we talk about this, which is um, ramp onboarding, because mm. for managers, that's a, um, it's probably one of the key things that you're getting measured on, right? Is because you got to make sure these people get in, right? Yes. And then they actually hit their numbers. Yeah. So what have you found are like the key things that have made sure that like folks hit ramp fast? Clear expectations, Will. Expectations. I don't, I'll break it down. Like, I mean, every, yeah. it, really, it all comes down to, hey, like people need to know what is expected of them. That's part one. The next thing they need to know is how do they meet those expectations to, right? And then I think also they need to be validated along the way. So in terms of they need to actually have the experience of pressing the buttons, making the calls and having somebody there next to them going, yes, yes, no, tweak this. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like also that consistent feedback too. So onboarding, to, for example, is not just, hey, like you need to make 50 calls. It's all right. In your first month or your first quarter, like here's your number. Here's what this means in terms of number of meetings you need to set on a weekly basis. Here's what that means on, uh, oh yeah, so here's what that means that you need to do on a weekly basis. Here's how you need to prepare to be able to do that on a weekly and daily basis, all the way down to like, hey, here's what it means in terms of here's how you manage your calendar. Here's the activities you need to do per hour. And here's how you actually do it too. So yeah. that's like, and then, because it also, so if you have that, then you need to then flip that into an onboarding schedule that like gets them ready for it. So it's like, hey, it's not just a matter of I need you to know how to make cold calls. I need you to know how to like open up a cold call with relevance mm -hmm. and like, you know, insert some kind of insightful comment. So you need to know business acumen. You need to know the customer problems. You need to know the questions to like highlight yeah. those problems. You need to know that they're problems when you hear it. So it's like, cool, we need to give you like business acumen, right. product, you know, persona acumen first. Then we're going to get into what does this mean for how you prospect and how you find opportunities. Now, here's what that means in terms of like how you use the technology to go and find that stuff. Now let's actually put it all together, right? Yeah. And then we reinforce after that. So, and here's how, like, so like they know they have the, um, 
they kind of have like the conceptual and contextual uh, awareness. And then they have you guiding them on how they put that into practice and you're giving them feedback along the way. So they know they're moving the right direction. Yeah. It's like part one is like building blocks on this, right? It's the, yeah. okay, here's expectations, but also like, I know that you're not going to be able to meet those expectations unless you know the following things mm -hmm. about us. Yeah. The problems that we solve for our customers, what's going mm -hmm. on with those customers. And then as well, like the market in general. Yeah. Uh, kind of that business acumen. Yeah. Um, then, I was going to say just one quick thing here is like, if you're in a leadership position, you probably have a high figure shit out capability or quotient. <laughs> The old FIO Q. <laughs> Majority of people don't have that. Yeah. So if you just say to somebody, hey, here's what you do, they'll go, what the actual frick nut? Like, I have no idea where to even start. Right. So you have to help guide them on how to figure it out. You have to figure it out for them, provide that guide, and, that, and then and only then, I believe, can you hold them to that expectation. But if you've mm. never... If you've never said, hey, here's the expectation, here's how you do it, that's a failure on you as a leader. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting being like in the startup seat because like you don't necessarily have the answer all the time. <laughs> and so you're like, you know, you're kind of figuring it out with them in that moment. Yeah. Like, but you can give that. direction. Yeah, you can still, part of you can, still, you can still give direction to people, but if it's just, yeah, it, again, it all... It depends. I think if you're in a startup, you have no idea what you're doing or what's going yeah, yeah. on or whatever else. Maybe you don't have SDRs yet. <laughs> yes. Maybe, yeah. maybe you just don't have SDRs yet. Yeah. Well, in the traditional sense, right? Like Not in the traditional brought, sense. We've hired people that are fantastic sellers, but like yeah. we hired in a way that like it could make sense, yeah. um, which, you know, shout out to both Scatleys and Amy Bolas for giving us tons of pointers and advice for making sure that we didn't mess that up. <laughs> um, but man, um, yeah, it's, it's such an interesting, because like when you talk about like hiring SDRs, like in the truest sense, mm -hmm. like that's such a good point. Like you, the ability to hire for some sort of ability to figure it out, like you're eventually going to run out of people. Yep, you will, you will. Yeah, I've I've talked to some some folks and they're like, who should I hire? I'm like, if I'm like, all right, if it's like your first person, like they need to be able to figure out like how to build a playbook for themselves. They need to yeah. be okay with testing and iterating. Like they're gonna know they're gonna need to know a lot about how this stuff operates. But like if you're hiring somebody, like for me, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna have a team of let's say 30 people. And that's it's not the biggest SDR team in the world. But I'm like, I might only be able to have like four or five people. Like if I have four or five people out of 30, I'm doing great. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point. But at some point in time, I'm like, I can't have 30 people who are all trying to figure it out in 30 different ways. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to go, well, why are they being successful? And I'll be like, yo, like, I don't know. Like, I'm not going to be a, I'm not going to be an SDR, BDR leader for very much longer. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that sort of gets to like issue diagnosis and like being able to like from those issues pull it out and say, you yeah, know, okay, we're figuring this out and we know what to do next. Also, I realize we're at five. Do you still have a few more minutes to chit chat? I can do two minutes. All right, let's let's hit. One quick hit, and then we'll talk about ways for people to connect with you. So okay. when it comes to identifying issues, would you focus more on the metrics or more on those one-on-one -on -one conversations that you're having? Both. So the first thing I do is I go and I look at the metrics to figure out where... Okay, so by the way, like I used to work... Um, as like a business analyst within a like a project management office and so my whole job was to map out like map out processes and figure out like what are the bottlenecks so that's how i approach it the numbers tell me where the bottlenecks are I, they don't tell me why yeah. or 
they don't tell me they just tell me the bottleneck is there but it doesn't tell me like what the bottleneck actually like where it's coming from that's where i go into the one-on-one -on -one and i'll say hey one thing that i'm noticing here is there's a uh, it looks like there's a bottleneck in between the time that you're making a call and when somebody's connecting at the call to connect rate right so if the benchmark is eight percent you're at three percent it makes a lot of sense why you're not getting any any answers um like what do you think about that and they might go like oh my mm -hmm. god you're so right i haven't been able to do all this now there's sometimes where people have enough awareness to go like hey here's something that i've changed i'll actually go into like outreach and i'll see has their calling behavior changed at all like it, to the point there's one person andrea uh, Andrea, what helped her be very successful was she would make calls like she'd average five to 10 calls every single hour. So she was calling pretty much consistently all day. One yeah. week ago, she's like, GB, I'm really worried. I haven't been able to talk to anyone. I haven't booked a single meeting. And I was like, well, for the last four months, she's always demonstrated this behavior. But for that week in particular, I went, I looked in the data and I was like, girl, you've only been calling one hour of the day. Yeah. Go back to what you're doing, right? So she, yeah, so you, you can so see the data, like it yeah. Was so then she's like, she's like, oh wait, like I have been. She's like, oh, I try to switch up my schedule because of blah 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 blah. And so then we went back to it, right? And then she's back at her eight percent conversion rate. She's booking as many meetings, and we're fine, right? So yeah. I, there are some times where the data won't tell me enough. That's it, it won't tell me the full story, but it can lead me, it can help me develop a hypothesis. And then I can then go and bring that hypothesis to the rep, depending on how aware of the problem the rep is. Like we, we'll brainstorm, we'll come up with an idea of, hey, here's how we're going to tackle this over the next yeah. month or so. Yeah, that's, um, I love that. Cause it's like, I think about building coaching software, right? And like part of that is like a lot of it we can showcase but we can't necessarily get that granular yet, right? It's like, no. I can show you that you're spending, you know, three minutes per email more this week than mm -hmm. you were last week. But what does that actually translate to? What does that mean? Yeah, more? yeah. Because there are some times where it's like, hey, heads up, like like the data, like, hey, I noticed that your, uh, your call volume dropped big time. I also noticed that your time to respond to lead went up twofold. What, like, yeah. hey what do you think's going on? And they might go, Hey, GB, like my dog died. I'm like, fuck, sorry. I'm not supposed to swear like that. Yeah. But like, you know, like I was like, that might, like that, that's, that's so again, the, the data tells me that there's something going on. It doesn't always tell me what's like, what's going on or why it's happening. And that requires conversations. Yep. I think it's a good place to end. Um, mostly cause I know you have to go. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Listen, she said the dog died and they said bye. So yeah. We're, yeah, we're, yeah, we gotta go now. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for jumping on. This was awesome. Um, for me. Yeah. Well, one, if folks want to connect with you, just head straight to your LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to go on my Instagram. It's nothing. Um then I would I wouldn't respond. LinkedIn is the best way to get me. Yes. That's and then is there a link to your SDR manager survival guide on your LinkedIn? Yes. So under my profile, there's like, now you can add in a, like a custom link and you can click it, but just click. It's nice. the new, the new age leadership model. It will prompt you to the page that has all my content that you can download on Gumroad. So the SDR manager survival guide is there. I've got effectiveness mat or metrics. I got pacing formulas, like all the things. It's all right there. All the goods. I love yeah. it. And I've downloaded it. I can tell you it's it's quite good. It was good enough for me to immediately turn around and say, hey, do you want to jump on LinkedIn Live? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you did. Yeah, you did. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much, Will. Thank you. All right. Bye, good. everyone. <laughs>